Well. All right. Um, so the oh, you can't hear. Um, is every am I coming through OK for everybody else? Yes. Yeah, okay. fine. Yep. Um, yep. All right. So it's, it's going to be on your end. Um, I can give you a, a minute uh, to, to figure out audio stuff. I'm sure I, I, of course, started the recording. So this is going to be the greatest, most interesting start to a YouTube video ever. Uh, but anyway, so the plan for today, we are almost certainly not going to use the full class period. What I'm going to do is we're going to spend the first bit just talking about what is this class? Why the hell are we taking it? What's the point? Um, and what is it? What does it even mean to do ethics and information technology? And then the second half of the class, I'm just going to share my screen and we're just going to go through the syllabus bit by bit um, and talk about what's expected, everything like that. Um, I'm going to put my name up here in case you don't know who I am. I'm David Neely. Uh, you can call me David, you can call me Professor Neely, you can call me Mr. Neely, you can just call me Neely, I really don't care. Um, don't call me sir, it feels weird. I feel like my father and I don't wanna be an old man quite yet. Um, other practical thing, my handwriting sucks. If at any point you can't read my handwriting, just you know, type in chat, what the hell does that say? Uh, that's fine and I will go ahead and tell you what it says. Sometimes I get really lazy and also I'm terrible at spelling. So uh, yeah, that's practical stuff. So um, I'll talk about my email and all at the end when we go over the syllabus. But uh, basically, yeah, this is me, this is our class. So philosophy 216, ethics and information technology. Um, first off, these words, are they at all familiar to you? I'm gonna try, also one other thing, I'm gonna try to make this class somewhat interactive despite the fact we're online. I find that if I just lecture the whole time, uh, by about week three, only four of you show up and everyone bored. So I'm gonna try to interact. Um, that means that even if it's something as simple as just typing the answers in the chat, if you want to, or you know, feel free, even if you don't have your camera on to talk, anything, just uh, to avoid the long, awkward silences as best as possible. So first off, ethics and information technology. Uh, two different parts, ethics, information technology. Uh, do these words or phrases look familiar? How many people have seen the word ethics? Feel free to raise your little Zoom hands down at the bottom or type yes or anything like that. All right, so a few people. Um, so ethics looks a little familiar. What about information technology? Does that look familiar? Okay, good, good. This is so it's not totally new for everyone, but it is probably something we haven't thought too much about putting the two of them together. So, um, ethics and information technology, flat footed question. What all do you think you, some of the topics are you're going to be studying this semester? Just so I can gauge what expectations are. Anyone have any thoughts, ideas? Um, pra practice that we're supposed to follow for to take care of the information. Yeah, so stuff about in information technology, we're talking about things, well, first off, what are we talking about with information technology? What sorts of things count as information technology? Any ideas? Personal emails, um, yeah. um, everything that is in, uh, involved in, in um, a person that's using the computer, that's, in, that's information. Here's the key word, computer. Information technology is just the fancy way of talking about computers and anything computer related. So it includes databases, it includes your iPhone, it includes a smartwatch, it includes uh, the internet in general, it includes whatever stupid platform, it includes CUNY first. All of that counts as information technology. Information technology, um, you know, it's just the IT department. IT, you know, the person you call when your computer stops working. IT is just the shorthand for information technology. So when we're talking about information technology, we're going to be talking about things, everything computer related. And then within that, we're going to be talking about things like how to make sure that you keep a, uh, what, what is the general importance of keeping a computer system secure? We're not going to be talking about the practical stuff of here's how you make a perfect firewall. It will rather be something more general about 
Why are firewalls important? What is the importance of making sure that you have a secure password? Why do we have passwords? Things like that, the whys, the bigger questions. Anyone else have some ideas about what we might be talking about? And if you don't have ideas, that's totally fine. Um. I don't know, like the safety that I, I mean, like, like for me, this is the, the class is about that, like safety, about keeping the information safe, um, protocols that we're supposed to follow. I don't know. I, I work for a company, so we're supposed to keep uh, keep changing our password every single amount of time. So, yeah. yeah, and so stuff like why, so passwords in keeping things safe, the, like questions like why is this so important? What is so crucial about this? Or things like, um, some of the other topics we'll be covering are just like how much information about you is available on the internet and how should you feel about it? There's a picture of you drinking a beer when you're 16 that if you go on Facebook, you can find. Is How worried should you be about that? Is that a problem? Should you have a right to say, hey, take that picture down? If you Google search and the first picture of you is you in a silly costume, is that something that you should worry about? What information can be gained from that? Other things we're going to be talking about um, this semester include things like, um, let's see, just the ways in which crime has changed thanks to the internet. So things like what sorts of crimes are committed using the internet and what should you be worried about when you go on the internet? So problem solving. So it's not going to be practical sorts of problem solving in terms of like you are having trouble with this code. Why isn't it working? It will instead be something like, I'm currently helping design a program that I know has flaws in it. Is it okay to continue doing this? Or I'm working as a subcontractor for the US government. And the thing I'm doing is targeting people of uh, Muslim descent. I'm collecting information and selling it to the government from a, in, this was an actual case that came up recently. Um, it turned out that one of the most common apps used, so one of the many millions of apps you can download is one which tells you which direction Mecca is from your current location. Now, why is this going to be valuable? Well, if you are a Muslim and you want to pray and you don't want to have to take the time of calculating which direction Mecca is, you've got an app that tells you. Now, the only people who are going to be downloading this app are going to be people who are Muslims because they want to know which direction to pray. How it, it turned out, however, that the company who created this app was collecting data, running patterns and selling that data onwards. And because of this, this was a question of, you agreed to the terms of service when you downloaded this app of your data can be collected, but is it a problem that we have this app that was collecting data exclusively on Muslims to sell it onwards to other people, you might worry about this sort of thing. So these are the sorts of questions that come up and these are the sorts of things. TikTok is another great one. How should we feel about TikTok? Um, on the one hand, like there's many levels of questions to this. One are political questions of TikTok is partially owned by a Chinese company that probably has some connections to the Chinese government. Secondly, there are things of TikTok videos are incredibly not, they're not regulated. So in theory, somebody who's underage could post a nude TikTok of themselves dancing onto TikTok. And therefore, somebody who sees that video who's over the age of 18 is technically watching child porn if this person posts a video of themselves dancing in the nude. Who should be responsible for this? Should the person who didn't know that this person was underage be charged with watching child pornography? Should TikTok be shut down as the service that provided someone with this ability? Should the person who posts this video knowing they're under 18 be in trouble? It's unclear how these sorts of things should be regulated. And so these are the sorts of issues. Um, so yeah, a lot of people are gonna say TikTok is gonna be responsible. And in a lot of cases, these are the sorts of ways in which we're pushing. But there's an issue of part of the reason that a platform like TikTok can get off the ground is because if TikTok was actually monitoring every single video that appeared, nothing would work on TikTok. Part of their business model is you need to be able to post things at a quick rate. And so things like... Um, if you monitored every single video that got posted to TikTok or 
whatever, you need a huge number of people constantly monitoring it. And you can't build uh, algorithms that do this sort of thing because the line between something inappropriate and the line and something historical. So there was a famous case in which there was a famous photo from the 70s of a little girl in Vietnam who's like a small child running away from a burning village and she was naked. And this is a very famous photo of like the, the trauma of war. And it was this very historical, um, it's a very hi famous historical photo, but Facebook flagged it as child pornography because Facebook doesn't know the difference, but like the algorithm doesn't know the difference between a historical photo and an actual like child pornographic image. So there's a very much of a blurry line. Um, I heard that TikTok has a zipper file within the app, which I heard is a big topic. Yeah, so there's a big question is apps are always gathering your data. Um, if you want to know, like, if you want to know if anyone could figure out where you are at any point in the day, we're going to talk much more about this later in the semester, but short answer is yes. Google knows where you are at all times. If you have your phone on you, they know. And if law enforcement needed to find out and they got a, uh, and you had your phone with tracking turned on, um, they would be able to know exactly where you were if they got a warrant from Google. So these are all the sorts of things. These are questions that appear and come up. And we're going to be talking this semester about a lot of the questions tied around information technology. So um, those are the sorts of issues. We're also going to be talking about things like, here's a fact of the matter. Um, what's the main way that people open their iPhones these days with these new iPhone 12, 13, whatever the hell number we're up to? Iris scan, fingerprint scan, um, yeah. passcodes. Faces, fingerprints all things like this. Face ID is the most common one. And here's the question is, on the one hand, what's the difference between face ID and entering a password? Well, in us one hand, there's no difference. The only main difference is that one of them you have to take the time and one of them is very easy. But there are important legal differences between the two. So for instance, um, if you are doing something and a cop says, I need to look into your iPhone right now, if it is locked with a password, they are not allowed to force you to enter the password because technically speaking, uh, legally, it goes against, I guess it's the Fourth Amendment or is it Fifth Amendment? Fifth Amendment, Fourth Amendment. I can never keep my amendments straight. Whichever one says you're not required to um, provide information against yourself in court. So a cop cannot say, I require you by law to enter your password. However, they are allowed to say, I require you to open your phone with a face recognition. You are not allowed to say, officer, no, because technically speaking, your face is a piece of public data, which is out there. So if a cop wants to make you unlock your phone and you say, you can't make me do that, if you have facial recognition, yes, they can. If, however, you have password protection, no, they cannot. This is a sort of question legal issue that comes up which you're not really thinking about most of the time you're thinking about technology. And so what we're gonna be talking about are these big questions that come up around technology that no one really takes the time to really think about. So you can think about it as we're using technology all the time. Now let's just pause, take a step back and ask, are the things we're doing okay? Or at the very least, what are some of the things I need to be concerned about when I'm using technology? Because the fact is, technology is everywhere in our lives. I'd be willing to bet many of, I mean, for me, what was the first thing I touched this morning? My phone. Why? Because it is my alarm clock. So what are some of the worries about this? The fact that my phone alarm clock, my Google, or I guess at least iPhone, knows what my alarms are because they're stored on my phone and can be restored. Is Apple allowed to take that information and learn my daily routine? Because in practice, they can do that. And in theory, they're allowed to. And again, how should we feel about this? Um, yeah, WhatsApp is now bought out by Facebook. So anything you say on WhatsApp is allowed to technically be gathered by Facebook. What can they do with this information? And we'll be talking more and more and more during the semester about some of these concerns. Other things we're gonna talk about with facial ID. So this is one concern around face ID. Another concern is 
Face ID is designed by country, uh, companies in Silicon Valley, large tech companies. Now, tell me about, close your eyes, close them and imagine, unless you're driving or something like that, imagine you're at, like, picture an information technology worker, picture a Google employee in your head. What do they look like? What does this person look like? It has glasses on it. Yeah, they typically have glasses. What, what gender are they in your mind? The first person to pop into your head. Male. Yeah, they're almost certainly a male. And what, what color is their skin or what race are they? White. Uh. They're probably white or they might be East Asian. And this is just a fact of the matter, which we'll be talking about later in the semester, is as a matter of fact, like 90 to 95% of the people working in Silicon Valley big tech companies are either white or of East Asian descent. And like 70% of them to 80% of them are men. At first glance, you might go, well, that's just because of X, Y, and Z. That's not really a problem because, you know, it's down the line. It's just because children at a young age are taught and over time it'll correct itself. It's not something to worry about. But the fact is it has practical complications. For instance, Facial recognition technology is really, really good at telling apart white people. If you give it to white people, it's really good at telling this is this person and this is this person. The problem is it's really, really bad at telling apart African-Americans and other black people. Now, why? Well, because when these programs are tested, they're generally tested on the people who are working in the company which means the tests, the way you teach AI or facial recognition is you just give them practice photos. You just give them photo after photo after photo and see if it gets it right. And then you correct things to modify it. Well, if everyone you're giving it is white, it becomes really, really good at identifying the differences between white people. It's not nearly as good at telling the differences between black people, which is a problem when facial recognition is being used in things like criminal justice. So if police are using this to say, they look at a security photo and say, is this person the same person as the person we just arrested? If it's a white person, it's almost guaranteed to get it right. If however, it's a person of color, the odds are that their odds are not nearly as good. So you, there's a much higher chance that they are going to misidentify who did it. Yeah. So a few years ago, you're like the best facial recognition software. It's especially black, bad at out women of color. So even like three, four years ago, it couldn't tell the difference. If you gave it a picture of Oprah and a picture of Michelle Obama, it was not guaranteed it'd be able to tell them apart. And like Oprah and Michelle Obama look nothing alike. So these are the sorts of worries we have. And you might say like, this is a concern that comes up and you might go, okay, we'll worry about that later. But um, the fact is it has practical real world implications in our everyday lives. So these are the sorts of things we'll be talking about. Um, so that's the general gist. Now, just so information technology is computers, anything computer related, um, Bitcoin, um, let's see what else, any video game you play, any app you have, all of that falls under information technology. Ethics, let's give it a, an official definition. What is ethics? Does anyone have a definition for what ethics is? Anyone know? It's basically like more uh, like a morale code, like anything like laws or because that's what really what it is. Laws and protocols and other stuff that we should follow. Exactly. But ethics, it's, it, ethics it's installed. It's a term for the study of morality. And what is morality? Well, it's just a set of principles and rules about what you should and shouldn't do and specifically a certain type of should and shouldn't do. It's the should and shouldn't do of being a good person or being a bad person. It's the good and, or it's the way of doing the right thing or doing the wrong thing. And not in the sense of just like the right thing to do is the thing that makes uh, like you follow the instructions. It's rather like the big picture right thing. So what are some examples of moral questions? And these can be, uh, um, what sorts of things are examples of right or wrong, good or bad questions that you might have or questions about your conduct? So just what are some everyday examples? They can be big ones, they can be little ones. They can be ones, you all face moral questions every single day. 
Should I uh there's a problem with the train pot. Uh I can't I can only think of the trolley problem or the the doctor problem where like oh if for the trolley problem you say uh pull a switch to save or sacrifice one guy to save five or let the five guys die to save one and then that creates a whole problem or the doctor one where there's five injured people and one healthy person and then should the doctor uh be allowed to take the healthy person's organs to save the five that that perfect marcus that's one we're going to be talking about a lot more uh next class so i'm not going to dive into it too much but that's a classic case you've got a situation in which you have the possibility of saving many people but you have to sacrifice a couple that is a big picture moral question another one should i believe in god this is one with a moral dimension of like does it make if i don't believe in god does that make me a bad person. If there is a God and I don't believe in this higher being, am I a bad person? Other sorts of ones are as simple as like, um, you find a wallet on the ground. There's $20 in it. Do you take the $20? Or do you bring it to, um, do you bring it to the police station? Uh, you accidentally, you're holding a candy bar as you're walking around in the Rite Aid. You accidentally get distracted on your phone and walk out with the candy bar when you didn't pay for it. Here's a moral question. Should I go back in Should I and pay for it or should I not? Am I a bad person if I don't? Here's another one. You promised your grandma that you'd come and visit her, but it's COVID and you don't want to get her sick. So what should you do? A classic COVID question is, are you a terrible person if you don't wear a mask? These are the sorts of questions that are ethical. So that's what we're talking about with morality. It's the study of right and wrong, good and bad. And the idea of ethics in general is that you're trying to figure out, here's how we generally judge what's a good thing to do. Here's how we judge what's a bad thing to do. Now, how do we apply those things to uh, questions that we've never faced before? So I know that it's wrong to um, kill but also now I'm in a war zone. Do the rules change? Or in what circumstances is it okay to kill someone? We know that in general, killing is wrong, but in self-defense, is it okay? Um, I know that I'm not supposed to tell a secret if somebody made me promise not to, but if their life's in danger, then how do the, our general principles of what's right and wrong get applied to particular cases? And so what we're doing in this class is taking sorts of general concerns about what's right and what's wrong and looking at the sorts of specific questions that come up in the information technology field. So for instance, we've got things like privacy. We value privacy and we know people want to have a certain degree of privacy. However, the nature of information technology is such that anyone has access to you at all times if they work for Apple or Google or something like this. Um, Alexa, if you anytime, there's a lot of myths around Alexa, but uh, by Alexa, I mean the, the Amazon Alexa, that little cube box cylinder that you go, hey, Alexa, and it goes, nah, 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 nah. So Alexa, whenever you are speaking to it and it turns on, that information is being collected in a database by Amazon. Now there's no evidence that if you don't turn it on, it's still listening. But there is a lot of evidence that it's very easy to accidentally turn on Alexa or Siri or any of these things. So there was a big, um, well, actually, we'll talk about that one later on in the semester. But there's a lot of questions around that. So these are questions that don't come up in everyday circumstances. Like in your everyday life, we know it's creepy to follow someone around and know where they go at all times. But in, in the information technology center, that's essentially what Google is doing. Google has more information about you then even somebody stalking you might. And yet we are happy enough to let Google collect that information. Should we be happy about it? Um, it's a matter of fact that if you want to know, like if I want to know what any of you look like, I just Google search your name and John Jay College and it pops up most of the time. Um, if you have a super common name, it's tougher to find you. But generally I can find out what everybody looks like and very often where you live. I mean, I had a student one semester who decided to prove to me that this worked by showing me the front of my own apartment building because you could find it through some Google searches. Is this something we should worry about? Because if like, you know, somebody knows where you live, it's like a terrifying thing because then they can do you harm. But as a matter of fact, most people who work for Google, if they wanted to, could find out where you live. All right, 
So those, that's what ethics and information technology is. Uh, it's really going to be asking and answering these specific right and wrongs about information technology. Now, the question is, how do you go about asking and answering these questions? And this is where the philosophy part comes in. So this is a class in the philosophy department. And uh, what is philosophy? Well, there's not really a good answer to this question. Out of curiosity, has anyone taken a philosophy class before? Raise your hand or type in the chat if you have. I'm not expecting, I'm assuming no background. Okay, we've got a few. All right. Um, so yeah, so you, this is actually higher percentage than usual. Very rarely are there more than just a handful of people who take philosophy classes. But um, basically what philosophy is, there's, as I said, there's not a good definition, but generally the way to think about it is it's a practice of asking and answering questions that can't be asked and answered or can't be answered in the usual sorts of ways. So for instance, um, you wanna know how much an elephant weighs. Uh, how would you go about finding the answer to how much an elephant weighs? What would you do? I'd Google it. You'd Google it. Why? Because presumably there's gonna be an answer on the internet of how much does an elephant weigh? Uh, and what is that answer probably going to be? It's probably going to come from some scientist who put an elephant and measured it or yada, yada. What's another way you might measure or you might figure out how much an elephant weighs? This one's less practical, but is at least in theory possible. You just need a, you need to find yourself an elephant and you need to get a, uh, Yeah, so here's another thing. Mohammed just said his Google Home just went off because I said Google, um, which is a problem because, you know, I'm going to be saying Google quite a bit. So if you want to put the Google Home in another room, it's probably going to do it. Yeah, so um, one thing you can do is what Anthony said. Yeah, you get a big scale and you get an elephant, and you could weigh it yourself. So these are the ways in which we usually answer questions. We either test them out ourselves or you go online or you ask an expert and try to figure it out. So it can be things like, you know, Google might tell you, or what should I get for, uh, or what, what food has more calories in it, a donut or a cupcake? Well, that's something you could test. It's something that you could look up online. But there are lots of questions that don't work like that. Things that are very, very often like big picture questions. You can't just look up the answer. You can't just mix things together. You can't just weigh it. So a question like, does God exist? You can't just like mix some chemicals together and like all of a sudden God pops out. That's not how a higher being works. You can't just Google like somebody else who's done a test of whether God exists. All you can do is think about it really hard and see what other answers people have given. So you can go, well, this person has thought God exists because of X, Y, and Z. Do I think that's right? Do I think that's something that's a good reason to believe that a higher being exists? Or a question like, is there an afterlife? Well, we don't know for certain because we can't go to an afterlife and then come back. So all you can do is look at the reasons or think about it really hard. So what philosophy is, is essentially using thinking and rule following and reasoning to try to answer questions that can't be answered in any other way. So these can be things like um, some non-cyber ethical questions or non-information technology questions include things like, uh, what makes me the same person today that I was when I was born? When I was born, I was like this big and all I did was cry and poof. Now I am much taller and I do more than just cry and poof. So what makes us different from the children we were when we were born? What makes it the case that that's a baby picture of me? There's no simple way of answering this question because every single cell in your body decays and switches. You don't remember being a child. So these are the sorts of questions. And so a lot of the time you might think like, oh, what is the point of asking these big picture questions? Why should I care? What sh why should this matter? Well, a lot of them have practical implications. So things like, does God exist? your answer to that question is going to have fundamentally different impacts on how you live your life. If you believe in a higher power, you're far more likely to go to an organized religious service. If you don't believe in a higher power, you're probably only going to go into a house of worship for somebody's wedding or funeral. 
Oh, so these are the practical sorts of implications. Now, when we apply these methods to information technology, we're going to be looking at questions of things like, is it a problem that Google knows where I am? Or what needs to be done about the fact that facial recognition technology has trouble telling apart people of color? Or does the fact that um, does the fact that law enforcement is allowed to create fake Facebook accounts friend you and then get information about you in that way? Is that something which we should be worried about or is that something we should be fine about? Is the fact that Google turns on, the, the Google Home turns on when your professor says, well, I'm not gonna say it because I'm, I'm sure Muhammad's tired of me saying, is that a worry that that thing is now turning on? Is it the fact that I'm able to get information? Is it a fact that somebody can hack into your account and uh, the company doesn't get a big punishment? Is that a problem? And these aren't questions you can answer by just running a test. These aren't questions you can answer just by sitting down on your own Google and Googling it. So does everyone understand generally what we're going to be looking at? Yes. Like what, what the general class is. Now here's the, the question. Yes. Oh, why this class in particular? And this is the last thing I want to talk. Also, just one other point of business. If at any point I'm making no sense because I can, or I'm going off on too much of a tangent, or you need me to repeat anything, or you have a question, just type in the chat, shout out loud. Don't be afraid to cut me off. I do not take it personally. I want you all to talk. I want you all to engage. Whatever that means, however that works for you, I just want some level of engagement and if that means cutting me off and just going, hey, professor, whoa, 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 that made no sense. Or what the hell are you talking about? Totally fine. Just cut me off. Get me going. So what is the point of this class? Why is this a class? We have lots of ethical questions that aren't in classes. Um, you know, there, there's a special set of rules that govern talking to your grandmother. What are some of the rules that we follow? that we are specially designed for talking to grandmothers. Talk respectfully and slow. You can't talk respectfully. It's not just like, you can't talk to your grandma the same way you talk to your best friend. There are things you can say to your best friend that you can't say to your grandmother. There are words you can't use to your grandmother. Another one, when she inevitably doesn't realize, and I feel like this is more of a, an issue given uh, COVID and the fact that I feel like everyone is now having remote hangouts with their grandparents, don't get too frustrated when she can't figure out how to turn the camera on. That's another ethical rule. Don't yell at grandma when she's computer illiterate. Don't make fun of grandma for being computer illiterate. These are all ethical questions around grandmothers, but there's no such thing as grandma ethics. There's not a course 217 grandmothers and or ethics and grandmothers. That's not a class that exists. So why is ethics and information technology a class? Why is this one a class? Anyone have any ideas why this is specifically a class? What is it about information technology and ethical questions that makes this different? Mark? Uh, um, I think it's because so much of our information is online now. Banks, credit cards, social security numbers, um, passwords, anything that could jeopardize our um like security, because as soon as somebody gets a social security number, you're kind. it's kind of, of a pain and also a very big uh, risk because that deals with all your money and it's also s s like specifically set to you and it's also permanent, but there's also a bunch of hackers and um, people who get into technology who want to do malicious things are known as black hat hackers. And um, this is basically te trying to teach us um, to instill, um, instill a good uh, moral code of what we use technology for instead of just trying to, uh, oh, like ruin somebody's li life, like, oh, DDoSing somebody or potentially hacking the router, and, uh, which is totally highly illegal. And you'll probably get caught by the company of your internet provider. But it, stuff happens. Uh, black, uh, the black uh, dark web, a bunch of um, other huge, huge issues with um, security. And that's why we need a good moral code. Otherwise, a lot of people like young kids would learn and pick up uh, probably more malicious things and become a black hat hacker. And it, it's not, I guess, generally accepted as a good like thing because it does hurt a lot of people. Yeah. So there, you just touched on three, I think there were three major reasons you just touched on. One of them is technology is everywhere. Every element of your life involves technology these days. Everything from your, I mean, we're, we're literally having a class on technology 
because we can't be in the same place. So because of this, the number of concerns and ethical questions that can pop up are much, much larger. So you only interact with your grandmother in a certain small set of situations. You interact with technology just about every single minute of your life. And because of this, because it's being everywhere, the consequences are absolutely gigantic. Because more and more and more things are being run off of computers, if you don't have a full understanding of what the possible ethical issues are around computers, there's the potential for things to go terribly, terribly wrong. So to take some classic examples, um, how many of you are computer science majors? Just out, usually it's the majority, but I'm just I am. Any other computer science majors? Yep. Yes, I am. So most of you, <laughs> most of you have spent a lot of time coding or learning to code. Um, how many of you have ever written a long, like multiple thousand lines of code with no bugs or problems whatsoever? Everything was perfect. Nope. Yeah. No. yeah, it's impossible to do that. No human being is capable of doing that. And yet, so everyone accepts that bugs are part of it just because of the nature of code. Everybody makes little bugs and mistakes, but what happens when those bugs and mistakes cause big problems. So for instance, um, it's possible for, and there are cases of this in which uh, a couple bugs in a code cause a machine to not work right. So for instance, there was a case of this radiation machine. So what is a radiation machine used for? It's a like um, medical machine. What do radiation machines get used for? Uh, chemotherapy. Yeah, chemotherapy or other sort of cancer treatment. So this machine is designed to give pulses of radiation to kill cancerous cells. What the issue was, this was a computer, computerized machine, like everything these days, but there were some minor problems in the code. So instead of giving a reasonable amount of radiation, it started zapping people and many people died. Like seven or eight people died because they were zapped. Well, here's a question of like, what are we supposed to do with this? If I ran up to one of you and stabbed you in the face and killed you, it'd be pretty obvious like, oh, that person goes to jail. That person is going to be there for the rest of their lives. If I have a swimming pool and I don't put a fence around it and somebody drowns in it, I'm being judged as neglectful. I didn't do my job putting up the pool. A child falls into it and drowns. So I'm still responsible. But how can you hold a coder responsible when everybody knows that coding is difficult and mistakes are made. And nobody is trying to cause this machine to break. Do you hold the company responsible? Because if, you're, if your family member dies because of this mistake, then what do you end up doing? Well, you don't want them just to say, eh, sucks to suck, problems happen. Like that's not what you wanna hear. But at the same time, how can you hold the coders responsible if they were working to their best of their abilities? Here are the sorts of issues that are coming up because the consequences of technology these days are massive. Life and death. These are the sorts of things. It's not like, you know, unless you're actively trying to harm your grandmother, grandma ethics aren't going to cause an entire city to lose power. With technology, city, cities can lose power. Life and death. These things are genuinely possibilities. Marcus. Oh, I was going to say that, um, yeah, you can't really hold a mic accountable i can't think of a situation with that because most companies uh usually put some small text in the terms and conditions which you you willingly assign but most people don't read them and uh yeah so that that it's really hard to get pin it onto the programmers because it's not really i guess it is their fault but at the same time it isn't because things happen but also they put it in the terms of service so you can't really be punished for it and this is something we'll be coming back to is terms of service um Terms of service, how many of you have, let me, let me think of the best way of putting this. When was the last time you accepted a term of service? Just think uh, about that. Probably yesterday. Probably the last few days, right? Like anytime a new program has got a term of service. How many of you actually read the damn thing? Nope. When was the last time you read a term of service? I've never read it before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never read the full thing. Yeah, I, I read it. Somebody did a study one time in which they calculated if you read from top to bottom every term of service, 
that you received in a year, how many days would it take you? And they calculated that it would take you, if you worked, ju- if all you did was read terms of service from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., five days a week, it would take you 66 days to read all the terms of service you received in a year. That's entirely, nobody's going to do that. But on the other hand, you are being If you go against the terms of service, you can be held accountable. You can be punished. If you do something against it, they can kick you off. So here's this worry of also, why are they so damn long? Why are terms of service so long and complicated? Anyone know? Uh, Basically, it's one probably to, it's because it's all played on wording. Wordings can mean everything. And so like, if it's not specific enough, um, people can find loopholes and that's really what it it denies. It's mainly mainly to cover loopholes, not be held, uh, have the company not be held accountable so they can't be sued. And then also they, um, they basically, it's basically for immunity, I guess, for, um, against all charges. So yeah, the company is designing these things to give themselves cover. So if you do something wrong, they want to make sure or something bad happens, they want to make sure they can't get blamed. And part of this, part of the reason they're so long and complicated is they literally don't want you to read it. Why? Well, if you don't read it, you are less likely to know what what rights you're giving away. So therefore, they can do things that if you were to stop and think about it, you might not be happy about. But if it's 37 pages long and written in something that's not even really English because it's got all these lawyer terms, therefore you're not going to read it, which means they can get more out of you. So why is it like Facebook is collecting your data constantly. But if you knew that, if everyone who like realized this knew, um, everyone who used Facebook realized that Facebook was collecting all their information and selling it, a lot of people might get a little worried about it. So why not bury it in 37 pages of terms of service saying, I agree to give away all my information to Facebook? Well, if you do that and you never read it, you're less likely to call Facebook out. And you're less likely, it's far less likely down the line, if you're like, hey, Facebook, you stole my privacy. They can go, well, you know, you signed it away. You you agreed to allow us to do this. Um, So these are the sorts of things around terms of service. And because of these sorts of things, I don't remember how we got down this this um, rabbit hole of terms of service. But the idea is that like these sorts of things are everywhere in your life. And these sorts of terms of service questions can have huge consequences. These are things like, you know, children's, uh, like a lot about anytime you post a photo of your baby, it's in theory possible that somebody at Facebook could get that information about your baby. And that's something which you might be hugely worried about. Um, So yeah. Consequences are huge. Technology is everywhere. Another one is it's easy to do bad stuff. And so here's here's a term that we're going to talk about a lot this semester. Policy vacuum. So what is a vacuum? I I have no idea if that's how you actually spell vacuum. What is a vacuum? Not in the sense of like, but in the sense of like space is a vacuum. What does that mean? It's basically like a never ending hole. Like you can't. You can't get out of it. It's a completely empty space where there's nothing there. So what is a policy vacuum? Well, in this case, a policy vacuum, this is meaning like legal policy or government policy. A policy vacuum is a situation in which there's an empty space in the law where there aren't laws that apply to something. And very often policy vacuums come along when new technologies or new things are invented and the law hasn't had time to catch up. So for instance, um, there's a huge policy vacuum around things like what Facebook and Instagram, well, those are the same company, but Facebook and Twitter can do with your information. There are very few laws governing that. Why? Well, because the technology came along so quickly that by the time the technology was made, the legislation in Congress did not have the time to write the laws. It takes fucking forever for anything to get done in Congress. Um, You've got to debate it. You've got to write it. You've got to redebate it. So very often what happens is by the time they have a law to govern a piece of technology, that technology is obsolete. There was a famous case in which, um, how many of you know what pagers are? I have a general idea from movies and stuff. (laughs) So what a pager was, was this little device that came along in like the early 90s. And what would happen is somebody would call your pager and it would list a phone number. 
And then you would have to go find a phone and call that phone number. It was before cell phones. So these things were, you know, basically as soon as the cell phone became popular, the pager died. And so pagers basically went obsolete in like the mid nineties. The court case that decided the legal, there was a Supreme Court case about what the legality around pagers were and what information could be collected by police around the pager. The case wasn't settled on in Congress until the 2010s. That was 15 years after nobody used a pager anymore. So here's this worry of like, by the time we get these laws in place, we don't actually have the technology anymore that these laws are about. We have new technology with new worries. And so like, there's no technology around Bluetooth. There are, there's no le le uh, laws around Bluetooth. Bluetooth is something that's very exploitable. There's no laws about what Facebook can and cannot collect on you. They're trying to push that. One of the things that Biden is trying to push is new laws on that, but who knows if that'll get through. So these are the sorts of issues. And because of this, because there's no laws, it's very, very easy to do things that are technically speaking, if you stop and think about them, highly problematic. So this is another thing is it's very easy to do and get away with things in, with information technology that you couldn't get away with in everyday life. Another thing that comes up with this is um, how many of you would, uh, I mean, classic case, how many of you have gone on to the comment section of Reddit for anything? I have. Describe the, the, the sort of tone in which people speak to each other on Reddit. Super toxic, <laughs> Some, depending on the thing, of course, but mo there's a lot of just disagreements, toxicity, and a bunch of other stuff. It's usually, no one is like, well, dear sir, I respectfully disagree with your point, but I respect you as a person. No one ever says that on Reddit. It's, yeah, everyone is mean. Also, like, if somebody, like a famous story, like female news reporter writes a story a large group of people don't agree with. What happens within two days on her Twitter? Uh, a lot of hate, flaming, blame, uh, backlash. And very often if it's a woman, there's almost certainly gonna be some sort of rape threat being made. And that is an unfortunate fact about the internet is if you are a, a woman and you say something somebody doesn't agree with, somebody in, on the internet is going to say, I'm going to rape you, or you deserve to be raped, which is a horrendous thing, which nobody would say to somebody else's face. Nobody who says these things on the internet, or at the very least, a tiny, tiny fraction of the people who are willing to say things on the internet would actually say it in person. Why are people able to do it though? Well, because when you're on the internet, you feel anonymous. You're willing to say horrible shit to people because you can't see them be hurt. If you say something mean to someone face to face, you have to look them in the eye and watch them cry. If you do it from halfway around the world, you don't have to. So these are the sorts of cases. So cancel culture is something we're definitely going to be talking about this semester because it's becoming more and more prevalent. And it's, um, for those of you who don't know, what is cancel culture? Um, it's like basically when like something bad happens to like mostly it happens to like celebrities, but if something happens to a celebrity and it's like really bad, like um, Shane Dawson got part of the cancel culture. Um, basically, people start like digging up stuff and everyone just cancels them and like gives them a lot of like a bunch of hate. And then basically like that's the whole like logistic of like cancel culture. Yeah. So. Usually it's going to be the sort of thing when you find out that somebody uh, in usually in pop culture, uh, a celebrity of some sort whose public face is their career. So actors, musicians, you find out that they did something that you don't agree with. And then you decide and you say, this person shouldn't be allowed in the industry. We don't want to support them. So in a lot of cases, you look at it and you think cancel culture is probably going to be uh, like not, a, like there are certain cases in which cancel culture seems okay. So for instance, yeah, when you unsubscribe from a celebrity and tank their popularity, usually because of their views. So for instance, if you find out that, um, I don't know, uh, I don't want to like attach any actual celebrity to this. So imagine you've got a celebrity and it turns out 
that they were at the riot at the Capitol and punched a police officer. In that sort of case, you might think like, oh, this is a good reason not to agree with this person. This is a good reason to not support this actor's career and to have them, I don't wanna support them, I don't wanna support what they stand for. And things like their publishers say like, you know what, this person types a lot of anti-Semitic things. We don't wanna be a part of this. We don't wanna deal with this. We are not going to support this person anymore. So in that sort of case, it seems okay to have cancel culture in an extreme sort of case. Or to take another one, um, the Harvey Weinstein case where it came out that this man had been for years sexually exploiting women um, and using his power to get them into compromising situations in which he took advantage of them. It seems like it's a good thing that this man's career fell apart because of this. The issue comes up though, because people very often want to, uh, people on the internet go to extremes. So if somebody says something, which is, you know, not at all extreme. So you can imagine some person coming along and saying, well, Trump's not, was not the worst president in US history, which there's a good argument to be made that he was not the worst president in US history. But if somebody sees this and thinks, well, that shows that they're a Trump fan, then the next thing you know, everybody who's anti-Trump is trying to cancel their career, even if this person's views are actually quite moderate. So that's the worry with cancel culture, is can it go too far? Can it stop people from having reasonable debates? Um, so yeah, these are the sorts of things, and we have no rules around what you can and cannot say on the internet. So instead what ends up happening is people step in and there ends up this sort of vigilante justice or witch hunts. And a witch hunt is when people like, um, average citizens take it upon themselves to go, well, nobody's taking care of this, therefore we're gonna solve this problem. So for instance, um, in a lot of cases, there were police officers who uh, after like, um, when the first shooting of, or like the first major protest took place in Ferguson, Missouri, however many years ago that was now, um, what happened was the police of, of Missouri were not releasing the information of the cop, the cop who did the shooting. So therefore, a bunch of people went on the internet and decided this information needs to be public. So they released this person's name, their picture, their address, and everything else. The problem was the cop that they doxed in this way, the cop whose information they released, wasn't the one who actually shot the man. So here's a major case in which... Uh, you know, can't like we need to cancel this cop's life, but you chose the wrong cop. So that's another worry with with cancel culture is it's like the masses are deciding without any sort of checks and balances in the way. Um, the last one, the last reason I want to talk about is ethical considerations for most of you. You are all, or at least many of you, are going to eventually try to get careers in information technology as a programmer, as a, um, as a uh, secure cybersecurity expert, as anybody who works in this field. And because you are looking to work in this field, and there are these policy vacuums, and there is so easy to do bad stuff, both intentionally and unintentionally, it's important to take time and think practically for yourself what is out there. Also, even those of you who are not computer science majors, it is very useful to know what sorts of concerns you should be worried about with the internet. Should, like, what the best way to keep yourself safe and to keep yourself from having your identity stolen is to know what sorts of methods are used for stealing identity, to understand what sorts of trouble is out there, what sorts of bad things people are doing and how to keep yourself protected. These are the sorts of things that are worth talking about because what very often happens is a new technology comes along, people just jump on it immediately, start churning out the money. And then after a while, somebody comes along and realizes, oh wait, there's all these ethical concerns that got forgotten as we pushed ahead with the technology. So for instance, um, in the industrial revolution in the 17 and 1800s in England, very quickly they discovered that uh, well, who was the best in, so industrial revolution, major machines came along, large ma mass produced manufacturing. Uh, there were large gears, large machines working all the time. Very quickly, uh, 
factory owners discovered who were the most useful workers in these situations. Who did you want to hire? Marcus? Children. Yeah, you wanted to hire small children. Why? Because they had little tiny fingers so they could fit in between the machines. Also, they ate less because they were smaller. Therefore, you didn't have to pay as much for food. So what you ended up with were huge factories with children working in them as young as like seven or eight years old. And these children were dying by the dozens because these machines were not safe. Somebody came along and said, wait a second, do we really wanna live in a society in which there are hundreds of thousands of children dying from these unsafe machines? Well, it, it started in that way and then people started pulling it back. So in the same way with technology, the first step of making sure that things improve and the world becomes a place you're happier in is you have to know what's out there and what the problems are. So then you, as you move forward in the field or in your everyday life, you're aware of what the issues are. So that's really why this class is worth taking and why this worth, class is worth talking about is your technology is everywhere in your life. And therefore the things we learn are going to be tied in with your everyday behaviors. Also, the things that can go wrong, your individual life can be ruined if you use a bad password and somebody steals your identity. Also, if you work for a tech company, say that works on military equipment and you accidentally make a mistake, well, knowing what the consequences could be can make it so you're less likely to make mistakes or you're less likely to demand if you're a manager and you're asking your employees to work too many hours, you can be like, oh, this is, this is something I need to worry about because I need to know what the consequences are. Also just, you might not even realize that what you're doing has negative consequences. You might not realize that when you uh, sign up, if you go on the internet and post something that is mean, that it might have practical consequences. Many of the people who say horrible things on the internet are young because they don't realize that if you say racist things to a stranger, that it's going to actually hurt them. There was a case recently in England in which an English soccer player was subjected to racist abuse on Twitter and they tracked down the person who said these terrible things to him. And it turned out that the person who did it was like a nine-year-old child. Um, these are the sorts of cases in which we need to think about these sorts of things because nobody else is going to do this thinking for us. We don't have the laws. We don't have the practices. So it's important to think about these things because of the nature of technology and the nature of the world and the nature of our views around these things. All right, anyone have any questions? So this is just kind of a flavor of what we'll be talking about all semester. Any questions, comments, concerns on the what are we doing here? What's the point of this class front? Okay, well, with that done, I now just literally, if I can figure out how to share my screen, which is always an adventure, um, I'm now going to share my, my screen and we're just going to go over the syllabus. So um, let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Share screen. Do, 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 do. Screen two. No, that's all your, your smiling faces. All right. Is it shared? Is it working? Yes, Professor. Yeah, it's working, yeah. Professor. So it should say ethics and information technology. All right. So can you see my little mouse or is that not showing up? Yeah, it's showing. Okay, yeah. Perfect. Do you see the chat as well or just the information and technology? Box? It's just the web page. Okay, the... perfect. All right, I can close my email too. All right, so this is our class, Ethics and Information Technology, Phil 2, 1601. We meet on Zoom every Friday from 10.50 to 1.30. Uh, three units, all the normal stuff. All right, this is me, David Neely. Here are my email addresses. Either one of these works, they go to the same place. Uh, I just wanted to put them both on here because for some reason the um, the John Jay email refuses to let me send emails from my John Jay email. I can receive them, but I can't send them probably because I'm not the most technologically savvy and also because I just hate trying to figure this stuff out. So I just want to make sure that you see both emails because sometimes you will get an email from the Neely DJ and I want to make sure, I mean, you're all smart people, you know it's me, but I still wanted to include it. All right, office hours and office location. Well, the office location is a Zoom meeting, office hours. Basically, I find that um, I don't like to have set office hours because what ends up happening is most people never show up until the week of papers, and then I don't have enough time. So generally what I like to do um, with uh, office hours is basically just have it that 
I will meet with anyone whenever you want to meet. Uh, so long as I'm not busy, but this way we can set up something. I can, I'm much more flexible, uh, especially since meetings will be on Zoom. I basically, you send me a message by email, I will be able to uh, contact you back and we can set up a Zoom meeting. Um, all right, so introduction. I, you're, you're all literate, so I leave that to you. All right, all of you are here. You made it to the class Zoom link. Great work. Here it is, uh, in case you need it, it's up here. Um, it's also posted on the Blackboard as you all figured out this morning. Great job. All right, um, making a class group. I am utterly incompetent at doing this. So I'm gonna need somebody to step up. If somebody wants to step up and make the sort of group chat, I'm, I can then uh, post it to the Blackboard so you can all communicate with each other. Also, I've, if you want me to be on the group chat, I'm willing to, but I generally assume it's better if I'm not there and I don't join so you can all say whatever you want about me and it's a safe space. And I'd much rather you all have somewhere where you can talk behind my back and say that I'm being incompetent and feel safe about it as opposed to having me looking over your shoulder. Like this is your way to all help each other. And if I'm in the room, it'll just be a different context. If, you, um, if you're having a question about it and then somebody wants to email me and be like, in the group chat, we had this question, professor, what's your answer? That I think is probably the safest way to feel more comfortable without me looking over your shoulder. All right, remote logistics. Um, I don't ever know what the CUNY policies are. As of last semester, it was, I cannot punish you for not attending. And I assume that's the same rule. And just because of the nature of COVID and everything else, even if it wasn't the policy, my policy is gonna be, I'm not gonna penalize anybody if you can't make it. The world is a chaotic place. We have had over 400,000 people die of COVID in this country. I haven't got, I, I mean, I look like a, a shaggy person because I'm too terrified to get a haircut. Um, I'm not gonna, by the end of like the, until the vaccine becomes general, like by the end of this class, I'm just gonna look like a terrible, like, like the worst rock star ever with just this terrible long gangly hair and I'm gonna look ridiculous and why? Well, because I'm not going to go into a hair salon or barber shop until I feel safe doing so. So if the world's like this, I'm not going to punish you for not attending. If you want to let me know um, that you're not going to be here, or if you miss many, many classes, it's a good idea to let me know why you are missing. Um, just let me know the situation. If something comes up, if family members are sick and you can't attend class, just let me know. I'm generally, the world is crazy. Therefore, my policy is be lenient, um, work something out. And if nobody ever shows up, I will be very sad. I will cry a little bit. Um, but again, if you have to miss class every once in a while or even a lot of classes, uh, that is okay. Now, recordings and cameras, because many of you will probably have to miss here and there, be it for technical reasons or be it for something comes up with your family, somebody gets sick, you get sick. Um, I will be recording all classes and posting them to YouTube. The YouTube link is up on the Blackboard already, but there are no videos on it. I will start by posting this video. Um, so that's just the, uh, the general gist is I will be posting YouTube videos. So if you miss or you zone out for a little bit and want to rewatch it, this will be up there. Um, all right. Course requirements and grading. Oh, oh back to cameras. Um, so, uh, because logistical difficulties, if you do not want to be recorded and you don't want your voice recorded, you never have to talk. Um, but as I'll be talking about in a second, there are, there is a participation grade, but there are many ways to count as participating. All right. Um, course requirements and grading. The way this is going to work is there's going to be a weekly discussion question. Um, it was going to be about a question leading up to the next class. Um, so, uh, it will usually be a single question. Sometimes there will be two questions, but usually it'll just be one. And they're just, usually it's going to take about a paragraph to answer. And I, I'm not, I'm grading them, um, pass fail. So do not worry about it. Basically, if you want to fail these things, you have to try to fail them. As long as you're trying and putting an, an honest effort to answer the questions, you will not be, uh, penalized on these things. Even if your answer is something that is out of left field, as long as it's somewhat tied in, you will pass. So 
25% is going to be part of uh, those discussion questions. 10% is going to be participation, which I'll get to in a second. And then there's going to be two papers. Um, papers matter a lot to me. I care about them. I think it's an important skill to learn. So we're going to spend a, a class, half of a class, sometime during class talking about how to write papers. I will be giving you particular prompts. I will give you some sample papers to read. So you will get a, uh, you will get a whole spiel about um, paper writing. And I'll talk more about that when it comes time. And I'll talk more, a little bit more about it below. All right, uh, a little more on the discussion questions. Most weeks there's a discussion question or questions posted to the class Blackboard. Usually it'd be just one question. Occasionally there'll be two. Uh, actually, I'm pretty sure all the questions are already posted. So if you wanted to work ahead, you can. Um, there's probably some typos, things in there. If any of them don't make sense, feel free to reach out but they are on the Blackboard listed under discussion board. And it's literally just like answer short question. A lot of them, most of them don't even have right answers. Um, they're going to be due on the end of days on Thursday. So basically that means get it done by the end of the day Thursday so I can look over them before class starts on Friday. Uh, I will usually not be giving any comments on these things. It's literally just, if you did it, I, I want you to have thought about the material a little bit before class starts. Um, also, I don't grade things in the middle of the night. So if this says uh, do end of the day Thursday, really as long as it's like early morning Friday when I wake up, I don't care. Um, so don't, don't like kill yourself to get something in at 11.59, 59 p.m. Um, Questions going to be related to the readings for that week. They're going to be graded pass fail. Also, um, there's 11 total discussion board questions. You only have to do 10 of them. You are allowed to skip one. Um, generally, I say choose a week, like identify a week that's going to be tough. Don't just skip the first week. You might get sick. You might be worried. Save it for a time that things get busy. I also try to make it so that there's no discussion boards due the same week that papers are due. So it shouldn't be too bad. All right, papers. They're double spaced, 12 point font. They're usually three to five pages. Um, and I'll talk much more about this uh, the next class. Or I mean, sorry, not the next class. I'll talk much more about papers when we get closer to paper time. But basically, uh, my paper, my page limits are suggestions, and I generally am pretty lenient about things like uh, spelling, grammar, uh, citations. I don't care about a lot of that stuff so long as it's on there. All right. Um, make sh one thing I'm going to say now, and I will say it again and again throughout the semester. Please make sure that when you turn in a paper or a paper draft, your name is on it. Nothing makes me angrier than having to rename 46 documents. It infuriates me. It's a pet peeve of mine. It's a character flaw that I'm working on, but it really upsets me when I have to change 37 documents. So just make my life a lot easier, put me in a good mood and just include your name in the document, your last name, first name, whatever, just so I know whose paper it is. If you put me in a good mood, I grade more leniently. That's just a sad biological fact about human beings. Um, I do not offer rewrites on paper. So if you turn in a paper and you get a grade you're unhappy with, that's what you have. However, I am willing to meet with people to talk about your papers before you turn them in. And I'm also willing to go over drafts of papers if you email them to me a few days by a few days before. And if you send me a paper two weeks before, I give you some comments. You send me another one. I'm willing to do comments over and over again. So long as you get me comments before, like a few days before the paper, I'm or a, blah, 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 blah. You get me a draft a few days before the papers due, I will give you comments. So, and I'll talk more and more about that as paper time comes up. To pass the class, you must turn in both papers. So it's better to turn in something late than not at all. Um, participation, 10% of the grade is gonna be participation. Basically, this is to make sure that I don't have just a ton of blank screens where nobody engages at all. So um, ideally, a lot of people would have their cameras on. However, I understand the circumstances. Many of you, that's not possible. Others, you don't feel comfortable. Um, so if you cannot have your cameras on, that does not mean you can't participate. Participation, uh, it, the simplest way to participate is just turn your camera on and pay attention. However, if you do not feel comfortable doing that, you can also ace the participation in any of the other these following ways. 
You can use your microphone to ask and answer questions or make comments during class. You can ask and answer questions in the chat during class. This includes things like talking to each other about setting up a Discord and this sort of stuff. All of this counts as participation, as long as you're an active, engaged person in the class. It also, a few of you have been doing this, just spamming the little Zoom emojis so I know you're there and paying attention. It's simple, just like if you think something is good, give me a thumbs up. If you think something I'm doing sounds stupid, choose one that shows that it's laughably ignorant or something like that. Anything that just allows us to feel much more like a literal engaged class. I feed off of energy. I don't, it's just the way I am. This whole, I'm teaching from a seated position and this is weird for me. So just anything to make it feel like a more interactive, engaged class. Um, emailing me questions outside of class or meeting with me in office hours. I forgot to include that one on the syllabus, but anything so that we interact. Even something as simple as, um, like here's the final one. Something as simple as including a picture of yourself <coughs> on your Zoom. Here's just a sad fact about human beings. We generally are biased towards things we're familiar with. It's just a fact of human psychology that goes back to how we evolved. If you have one thing you've seen before and one thing you've never seen before, you generally prefer the thing that you've seen towards it. And generally, the more you prefer something, the more you remember it, the more you're engaged with it. So one side effect of this is if I know what you look like, I cannot help but remember you better and it will trigger and be easier for me to associate other ideas. So even something as simple as including a picture of yourself as your Zoom is just a helpful way to allow me to get to know you a little bit better. I just have an image to go, a face to go with the name. And so just I wish it wasn't the case that this sort of thing like affected my mind. I wish regardless, whatever you, whether I knew what you looked like or not, but the fact is I'm a human being, I'm not perfect. Therefore, if I know what you look like, I will remember you easier. The easier I remember you, the quicker I'll be to recognize who's emailing me. Wait, what was, the, I'll remember like, oh, this was the person who asked me in class about this. So let me send them this article. That sort of thing will be easier if I know what you look like. Um, required texts. Uh, there's a textbook, but um, I provided a digital copy to it. You can find it on the Blackboard. Uh, so you do not have to purchase anything for this class. There are also a bunch of supplemental readings, which are things I provided digital copies of. So you do not have to buy anything for this class for the readings. Uh, the textbook is this Tavani. Um, it's the fifth edition. It's the newest one that, that has finally become available. Um, so if you want to uh, ever find if you, I mean, it's up on the blackboard. So the easiest thing is just to download it. Um, I did my absolute best to make sure that there are no viruses on it. But if you are more technologically sound than I am and want to scan the damn thing, feel free. I like control P'd the thing. So it's a printer version of uh, an original document. So it's not a document that came directly from the internet. Uh, I think that should help a little bit. I'm not the most technologically savvy. So if you are at all worried about it uh, and you are technologically savvy, feel free to do whatever it is that you need to do to make sure it's safe. Um, all right, weekly readings and schedule. So each week there's the name of the class, the day we're meeting, and also if there's a discussion board due. Also what the readings are that we will be discussing that class. So these things down here are what we will be discussing before that class. So for instance, Next Friday, we'll be discussing the Tavani. That means try to read it before class begins so you know what we're talking about. Um, here's another thing. The world is chaos. I know that you are all overwhelmed because I'm overwhelmed. Um, I know that you all are dealing with complex situations with work and other things. I know that sometimes not all the readings will be done. Therefore, if at any point I'm assuming something about the readings and you haven't done the readings, it is better to just say, I'm sorry, Prof, I didn't do the reading. Can you explain this idea to me again? I would much rather I have to talk about something because you didn't have a chance to read it and you come to understand it, than I just assume you read it and I go on blithely lecturing and you don't understand what I'm talking about. So again, don't be afraid to say X, Y, and Z came up. I didn't have a chance to read it. Um, that is something that, uh, you know, that sort of thing happens. Also, along these lines, and I'll say this again, 
um, throughout the semester. The world is crazy. If something comes up where you miss a deadline, just reach out to me. If something comes up and you know you need an extension, just ask me. I'm never going to judge anybody for not turning in things on time or stuff coming up or not getting stuff done in the way you wish you did. That This is a crazy time in the world. Uh, we're teaching over, I'm in a back room with a whiteboard leaning against a door. Um, so like the world is crazy. I'm not going like reach out if something comes up. If you get COVID, if somebody no gets COVID and you can't attend class, just let me know. Even if you let me know after the fact, just be like, professor, this is what happened. Also, if you feel better giving me a doctor's note, feel free to, but I'm going to, you're, you're all adults. I'm going to trust you all. Like if you want to lie to me and tell me your grandma died six times, like that is your call. I'm not going to follow up on these things. There's enough going on in the world. My policy right now and generally is just be lenient. The world's tough enough as is. I want you all to learn and enjoy and have one thing that's a little bit less stressful than it could be. Um, all right. So, uh, this schedule is subject to change. If anything changes, I will let you know. Um, end of day means 11.59 p.m., but as I said, as long as it's in my inbox by the morning, I'm not going to take off points. Generally, uh, I have the official policy is every day of paper's late. I forgot to say this. Every day of paper's late, you lose a third of a grade. However, it's COVID time. If you let me know and there's a situation, just reach out to me, even if it's the night of, and be like, Professor, I can't make the deadline. I'm, I will hear you out and we can work something out. Um, all right. Doop, doop, doop. Here's the schedule. I'm gonna leave it to you all to read this. The main things to note are that two Fridays from now, February 12th is Lincoln's birthday. We are the only school I have ever heard of that gets both Lincoln's birthday and President's Day off, but there we have it. No class that day. Also, we will have spring break down the line. Uh, spring break is going to be, I guess, the first week of, is this right? Yeah, the first week of April. If at any point you see something that's wrong on the schedule, just tell me and I'll fix it. Um, also, I have things listed like when the papers are due, when paper post prompts are posted. Um, before the papers, I will give you all prompts that I would like you all to respond to. Uh, as I said, I will be working with you all throughout the paper writing process. I'm not one of the professors who just says, go write a paper. I want to talk about what I'm looking for. I want to give you some samples. I want to make sure that you are all as comfortable as possible paper writing because it's something that professors all assume everyone knows how to do, even though writing a paper is very often something which there's a fun thing. Every professor generally assumes that some other professor or teacher taught someone how to write a paper and what they're looking for. And so what ends up happening is somebody's got to come along and say, no, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Um, all right. This last class, very often we, what ends up happening is we run over a little bit. So I've left the final few classes as uh, to be decided and finish up. All right. Uh, last few things are academic integrity. Um, I am now going to put on you can't see my face because I'm sharing the, uh, the document, but I've got my very serious face on right now. This is the don't cheat moment in the syllabus. Basically, um, don't plagiarize your papers. Why? Well, one thing I'm going to say is my papers prompts are weird. I usually stay up very late at night and come up with very strange situations that involve aliens and the devil and like all sorts of weird things, you become president, all sorts of crazy things come up. Therefore, if you try to plagiarize my, a paper for my class, generally what ends up happening is you just turn in a piece of crap. And so even if you didn't plagiarize, or even if it, it wasn't plagiarized, the thing you turn in generally is not responsive to the prompt and fails. So for your own sake, don't turn a plagiarized paper in. Secondly, the best way to ensure that you do poorly in a class is to make the professor mad. And plagiarizing is one of the quickest ways of making a professor mad because they have to fill out a shit ton of paperwork that they really don't want to do. So save yourself and everyone else the headache and just don't copy the paper from the internet. You will do poorly and it will go on your record and your professor will get in a bad mood um, because they have to fill out a paper, a bunch of stuff. Now, 
That said, I understand the urge to plagiarize. I know you all have a lot of things and I know the world is crazy and I know right now school is exhausting. Therefore, I'm going to uh, be like, I, I want you all to ask me for extensions even if it's the night before. If it's 11.59 p.m. the night before a paper's due and you send me an email and you're like, professor, I'm not gonna be able to get this done. Can I get an extension? I would much rather have you do that than plagiarize. So please reach out to me. Please let me know the situation. And that way we can avoid any plagiarizing, anything like that, and things will go much more smoothly. Um, lastly, uh, accessibility services. There aren't any tests for this class, but if you need any assistance with anything, um, just reach out to the accessibility office. Finally, if at any point there's a religious holiday, that falls on a day we have class and you cannot make class, just let me know and you are 100% fine not to attend. Again, I can't uh, punish you for attendance at all this semester. So even if this weren't the case, but anyway, um, that is syllabus stuff. Any questions at this point? Oh, I have one actually. Yeah. For um, length of papers and um, uh, discussion board, is it, you, you said that the papers were just, um, and like, or the length that you say is just like a recommendation. Yeah. So does that mean I can run a like a lot over just in case like I want to explain a lot more or? Here's what I will say on that. Um, short answer is yes, you can run over. Long answer is I say three to five because generally I found that over the years, uh, people who write the best papers usually fall within that three to five page range. Now, I have gotten A papers that were two pages long and I've gotten A papers that were nine pages long. I may have even gotten an A paper once that I think was 11 pages long. The reason I suggest three to five is very often when people are running over, it's because they start repeating themselves or there's a lot of unnecessary fluff in the papers. So this is a suggestion. Now, if your paper is incredibly concise and you just wanna cover a lot of information and all of it ties in and your paper runs to 35 pages, I will not punish you for being a, turning in a 35 page paper. What I'll say is very often, if your paper is 35 pages, it's because you didn't proofread. But I am somebody who famously turned in papers as an undergraduate that were way too long. And so I would be a complete hypocrite if I punished anyone else. So Marcus, if you want to turn in an overpage paper and it's concise and everything, I will never take off points for that. If you're somebody who thinks that you got a perfect paper in two pages, then perfect. However, very rare that somebody turns in a paper with enough information that's only two pages long and it's rare for somebody to turn in a long paper that doesn't repeat themselves it can be done and so I, that's why i say they're just suggestions i'm not somebody who's a stickler for those sorts of things um also i'll say it now but i'll say it again later in the semester on papers uh i don't care about spelling i don't care about punctuation i care about can i understand what you're saying so if you can write in a way that i understand great i'm not going to punish you because very often spelling and punctuation is for an English as a second language situation. And I'm not gonna punish you for not being a native English speaker. That's the dumbest reason to take off grades ever. Um, English is a confused mess of a language anyway. Um, any other questions? Oh, and Marcus, also on the discussion boards, I suggest about a paragraph, but again, if you wanted to write me a whole paper in your discussion boards, I'll never take off points for that. Um, All right, thank you. Yeah, any other questions? All right, I'm gonna stop the sharing so I can go back to the, there we go. All right, if there are no more questions, um, usually the way this class is gonna work is I will, we'll take a break halfway through, um, but today we're just ending early, which is why I didn't take a break. Um, so usually what we'll do is we'll probably go till around noon or noon 15, and then we'll take a 10 minute break. You can grab yourself a snack, you can run to the bathroom and then we'll reconvene. Um, but if there's no other questions, comments, concerns, if something pops up, uh, feel free to email me. Um, again, my emails are on the discussion board. I'm gonna post this Discord to the Blackboard as well for you all. Again, I will not join it, so you can all say whatever you want about me or anything else. Um, and with, the, and with that, I think that just about covers it. Uh, everything is on the Blackboard. Again, if you have any questions, email me. It goes to my phone, which means I get the emails pretty quickly. Uh, if I don't respond to you within like 24 hours, feel free to email me again. All right, 
Uh, so I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you all for first class. Thank you all for being here. And I will see everyone next week.